Youth here acknowledges that today we gather on Gadigal country. We pay our respect to elders past and present, to the traditional custodians who have cared for country for thousands of years, and we extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us here tonight. We acknowledge their enduring connection to lands, waters, skies and communities. These lands have provided a home for many searching for refuge and peace, including our Jewish communities. We walk together with respect and care on this land that sustains the spirit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and which now sustains us all. Good afternoon, everyone and thank you for joining us at Youth Here's fifth annual Yom HaShoah commemoration. In particular, we would like to acknowledge the Holocaust survivors who join us here and continue to share their stories. We extend a special welcome to our co-founders and dedicated team of alumni. Thank you to the CSG for keeping us safe today. Today, we are privileged to be joined by leaders from across the political spectrum, multicultural leaders from communities across the state and young people from all different backgrounds. We welcome Senator Deborah O'Neill, Senator Holly Hughes, Allegra Spender, MP, Dr. Marjorie O'Neill, MP, representing the New South Wales Minister for Multiculturalism, the Honourable Jackie Monroe, MLC, Alex Greenwich, MP, Matt Cross, MP, Rory Amon, MP, and Councillor H.Y. William Chan, City of Sydney, representing Lord Mayor Clover Moore AO. Welcome to the Presidents of our partner organisations, David Ossip of the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies, and Dr. George Foster of the Australian Association of Jewish Holocaust Survivors and Descendants. We meet today in a moment of mourning. Yom HaShoah, in English, the day of the catastrophe, is our annual day to grieve and remember the six million Jews lost in the Holocaust. We come together to acknowledge the devastation wrought by the Nazi regime on the Jewish people. In the 79 years since the end of the war, survivors have carried the burden of memory for our community. We have uplifted their stories and honored their courage. Today, we remember. We take the time to mourn, to honor, and to commit ourselves to a simple pledge, never again. 79 years seems like a long time. It is a lifetime. But the history of the Jewish people is longer, and times of safety and security are inevitably short. Today, Jews around the world once again question our safety. The lessons of the Shoah have never been more urgent. Today, the past feels like the present. What was once important to remember feels impossible to forget. It is our collective responsibility to speak up and to ensure that our pain and the pain of those who came before us is not forgotten. On Yom HaShoah, we remember who we are. We mourn for what we lost, what we continue to lose. But our destruction is not inevitable. At Passover Seder's last week, we were reminded that in every generation, Lador Vador. From the Egyptians, to the Romans, to the Nazis, there are those who seek to destroy us, and yet we are still here. If able, please rise for the Australian National Anthem led by Nikki Stanislav. Let's rejoice for we are one and free. Advance Australia fair In joyful strings and fantasy Advance Australia fair Please be seated. The greatest danger any civilization faces 
is when it suffers collective amnesia. We forget how small beginnings lead to truly terrible endings. A thousand years of Jewish history in Europe added certain words to the human vocabulary. Forced conversion, inquisition, expulsion, ghetto, pogrom, holocaust. They happened because hate went unchecked. No one said stop. My lords, it pains me to speak about anti-Semitism, the world's oldest hatred, but I cannot keep silent. One of the enduring facts of history is that most anti-Semites do not think of themselves as anti-Semites. We don't hate Jews, they said in the Middle Ages, just their religion. We don't hate Jews, they said in the 19th century, just their race. We don't hate Jews, they say now, just their nation state. Anti-Semitism is the hardest of all hatreds to defeat because, like a virus, it mutates, but one thing stays the same. Jews, whether as a religion or a race or as the state of Israel, are made the scapegoats for problems for which all sides are responsible. That is how the road to tragedy begins. In every generation, Jews have lived with the anticipation of persecution and expulsion. When do we leave? What can we take? Where do we go? Over the course of history, from generation to generation, most anti-Semites have not considered themselves anti-Semitic. And yet, as Rabbi Sachs reminds us, it is one of the enduring facts of history that the road to tragedy begins when Jews, as a religion, or as a race, or as the state of Israel, are made the scapegoats for problems for which all sides are responsible. The destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE ended centuries of Jewish life in the land of Israel. Since then, we have walked from country to country, searching for safety and yearning for home. No matter where in the world we found ourselves, it was not a question of if Jews would be persecuted, but when. It is one of the enduring facts of history that most anti-Semites do not consider themselves anti-Semites. We don't hate the Jews, said the Spanish inquisitors, just their religion. From King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, by the grace of God, to all Jews. You know well, or ought to know, that whereas we have been informed that in these our kingdoms there were some wicked Christians who Judaized and apostatized from our holy Catholic faith, the great cause of which was interaction between the Jews and these Christians, they have subverted and stolen faithful Christians from our holy Catholic faith, instructing them in the ceremonies and observances of their law, holding meetings at which they read and teach that which people must hold and believe according to their law, achieving that the Christians and their children be circumcised and giving them books from which they may read their prayers and declaring to them the fast that they must keep, persuading them as much as they can to hold and observe the law of Moses, convincing them that there is no other law or truth except for that one. This, proved by many statements and confessions, has redounded to the great injury of our holy Catholic faith. Therefore, we resolve to order the said Jews and Jewesses of our kingdoms to depart and never to return.
The ancient Jews were evicted from their ancestral homeland because their one god was at odds with the many gods of pagan Rome. Escaping this strain of Roman anti-Semitism, Jews settled in Spain from around 70 CE, where for many hundreds of years they lived happily and successfully among Spanish society until the virus of anti-Semitism mutated again. No longer persecuted for their monotheistic belief in one God, Jews were now despised for their refusal to accept the Catholic doctrine of Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. With the Alhambra Decree of 1492, the Spanish monarchs, Isabella I of Castile and Prince Ferdinand of Aragon, ordered that all Jews must either convert or leave. Luis de Carvajal was one such converser, a Jew who had been forcibly converted to Christianity. In a manuscript that survives to this day, Louis recorded the events of his life and his story of suffering and survival. Written in secret and smuggled out of prison in the face of mortal consequences, Louis describes the terrifying plight of his family who sought to honour their Jewish beliefs at a time when being Jewish was a crime punishable by death. I begin my life at the beginning. It should be mentioned that I was born and raised at Benevante, a city in Spain where I lived until the age of 12 or 30. Louis was born in 1566. <clears throat> At the age of 14, he and his family fled to New Spain, what is now Mexico, seeking refuge from the Spanish Inquisition's relentless persecution and the threat of public accusation. In their new home, Louis settled with his family, hoping to start anew, far from the Inquisition's reach. The Carvajals continued to secretly practice Judaism, maintaining the traditions of Shabbat, Kashrut, and prayer. The same traditions of their ancestors were now hidden from their neighbors and friends. In New Spain, Louis experienced a profound spiritual awakening, making the perilous choice to undergo self-circumcision, entering, entering into the ancient covenant at great personal risk. In this new world, Louis emerged as a pivotal leader, reaffirming the holiness of God and Judaism amongst the community of Muranos, those who secretly practiced Judaism. And yet, even in this distant land, the Carvajals could not escape the Inquisition's reach. We were in a continuous state of anxiety and trepidation, Whenever anyone knocked, we thought the Inquisition's nefarious ministers were at the door. We began to regard ourselves as arrested and even dead. So great was our fright that were it not for the danger of damning our souls, we would have taken our own lives rather than risk falling into the cruel hands of the terrible enemies. Despite their caution, Louis and his family were arrested by the Inquisition in 1589, charged with apostasy for practicing Judaism. We were about to sit down to dinner when the constables and notaries of the Inquisition knocked on the door. When they opened, the Inquis Inquisitional officers set guards there, raised ladders and mounted them, and came into the house to arrest my mother. Though wounded with this cruel enemy's fierce stroke, she donned the garb of modesty, bemoaning her troubles, yet praising the Lord who had sent them. She was with them brought to the pitch black prison by those ministers of malediction and executioners of our lives. After my mother was taken away, I was arrested. They found me behind a door where I had run for refuge out of fear of the atrocious tyrants. They pounced on me, seized me, and carried me to the gloomy black prison. Louis feigned repentance to avoid execution. Throughout his imprisonment, he remained devout, never losing his faith. Our imprisonment dragged on, and we remained in the hands of such cruel beasts. Our fear forced us to hide our true identity and we refrained from confessing that we were keepers of the Lord God's most holy law. If anyone confesses and affirms this fact, then he is subjected by these heretics to exquisite torture and is then burned alive. And yet, I refuse to renounce my faithfulness. As the family's imprisonment continued, the inquisitors resorted to ever more sadistic methods in their attempts to elicit Louis' confession. One Friday morning, the Inquisitors summoned my mother for a hearing. Through a small hole I could watch as my mother was led to the court of audience. When the tyrants saw that she continued to deny her family <coughs> practiced Judaism, they decided to subject her to torture. They immediately ordered my mother to disrobe. They stretched her chaste flesh on the instrument of torture known as the donkey and tied her arms and legs. Then they cruelly <coughs> twisted the ropes in its iron rings. As the ropes grated her flesh, she heaved the most pitiful sighs which could be heard by all. On my knees, in my cell, I heard it all. And that day brought greater affliction and bitterness than any day that had gone before. 
Ultimately, Louis' refusal to renounce his faith cost him his life. In Mexico City, on December 8, 1596, alongside his mother Francisca and sisters Catalina and Leonor, Louis was burned at the stake. He was just 30 years old. Following expulsion from Spain, Jews travelled all across Europe, encountering persecution on the basis of their religion in each place they went. The turn of the 20th century saw the virus of anti-Semitism mutate once more. It is an enduring fact of history that most anti-Semites do not consider themselves anti-Semites. We don't hate the Jews, the Nazis said. We just hate their race. Moved by the understanding that purity of German blood is the essential condition for the continued existence of the German people and inspired by the inflexible determination to ensure the existence of the German nation for all time, the Reichstag had adopted the following law. Article 1. Marriages between Jews and citizens of German or related blood are forbidden. Marriages nevertheless concluded are invalid, even if concluded abroad to circumvent this law. Article 2. Extramarital relations between Jews and citizens of German or related blood are forbidden. Article 3. Jews may not employ in their households female subjects of the state of Germany or related blood who are under 45 years old. Article 4. Jews are forbidden to fly the Reich or national flag or display Reich colours. Article 5. Any person who violates the prohibition under Article 1 will be punished with a prison sentence with hard labour. Escaping religious persecution, Jewish life migrated once more. Settling in Europe, new generations were flourishing by the start of the 20th century. New branches of Judaism emerged, encompassing traditional and modern practices, along with orthodox and progressive traditions. Jews played significant roles in commerce, finance, arts, sciences, and the professions. Communities thrived with bustling synagogues and schools. Festivals were celebrated, traditions were observed, and communal bonds were strengthened. Despite this cultural richness, anti-Semitism lingered, never truly gone. With the rise of the Nazi party came a new mutation of the ancient virus. A vibrant cultural tapestry began to crumble. The Nazi ideology, built on the supremacy of the Aryan race, spread across Europe. To the Nazi, there was nothing lower than the Jew, who was classed as the ultimate manifestation of racial impurity. The enactment of the Nuremberg Laws signified the systematic dismantling of the rights of Jews based solely on their race. This discrimination reached all Jews, irrespective of ancestry, personal identification, or religious adherence. Even the slightest trace of Jewish blood, just one Jewish grandparent, was enough to subject individuals to marginalization and persecution. Persecution was not the end. Millions were herded onto carts, taken to concentration camps, murdered in service of this warped ideology. Six million Jews were killed. Jews were vilified, discriminated against, and ultimately exterminated solely because of their perceived racial identity. All of a sudden, all the Jewish kids didn't have a school to go to anymore. One day, they came and they took all the children. We didn't know that they would come for the children. A dog had more rights than a Jew. All these neighbours, who we thought were our friends, they were laughing on the streets and they were saying, I'm going to move into that Jew's home tomorrow. I only had one swimming lesson. The second time I went, there was a sign saying, no Jews allowed. All of a sudden, on a loudspeaker, we heard a voice saying, everybody who is Jewish should leave the swimming pool. We were shocked. 
We used to go for coffee in the evening. Then we couldn't go into a restaurant. Jewish businesses were shut down completely. Schools were closed. What hurt us the most if the people looked the other way. Egon Sonnenschein is my grandfather. It's hard to put into words how grateful I am for our close relationship. I've always admired his dedicated work ethic, family values and wisdom. He's someone I can always go to for advice, being a constant figure in my life. We spend a lot of time together, often laughing, and I'm constantly amazed by his knowledge and insights. When I was growing up, he would tell the most amazing bedtime stories, creating a magical world that would captivate our imaginations. Born in 1930, my grandfather remembers his childhood as idyllic. He loved going fishing with his father, collecting stamps and doing gymnastics in the school hall. He created his own flutes and toys, including catapults. Egon, his older brother Kurt, and his parents, Albert and Erna, would go on wonderful family holidays. On one occasion, spending many hours searching for four-leaf clovers and enjoying the beautiful long days. When he was growing up, Egon's family was one of only 300 Jewish families in Slovenia. Every fortnight, a rabbi would visit from Croatia to teach both Egon and Kurt religious studies. They recall not learning much, but still got top grades. His grandfather was offered a position on the high court, but under Austrian rule, this came with a condition. He would have to convert to Roman Catholicism. He refused. Egon had numerous friends growing up, but was the only Jew in his class. He would never have imagined how things were going to change. When I was 10 years old, I went to my teacher, and the teacher told me that the principal wants to see me. Of course, I was very upset. I didn't do anything wrong. With a heavy heart, I went to the principal. He told me that he had the orders to expel me from school because I was Jewish. Notices came up. Jews were not allowed to go onto the street at certain time of day or night. Jews were not allowed to go to the public places. Jews, Roma, and dogs were not allowed to sit on the benches in the parks. Jews had to give up any means of transport on certain day, at certain time. Otherwise, terrible thing would happen to us. When I went onto the street, I saw my friends coming. All of a sudden, he saw me, turned and crossed the road. He didn't want to meet me. Why? Terrible propaganda against the Jews. We had a major problem. Nazi Germany were very powerful. They conquered one country after the other one. If anybody resisted them, they would just blast them all to smithereens. They were well organized, superior armament. They didn't worry if they killed civilians. Now the big question was, what is going to happen to us? On the 1st of August, 1941, there was a big commotion outside. I wanted to see what happened. I peeped behind the curtains to see. And I saw men, women, and children tied together with ropes, hit with butts of their rifles, prodded with bayonets, shot with fire. Terrible. They marched them onto the bridge of the river Una. When they were in the middle of the bridge, one or two people were killed. Everybody was thrown over the railing. Of course, everybody drowned. Or they just took them to the edge of the river. They would kill them, they would fall into the river. And one of their favorite ways how to kill people was to take two people, tie them back to back, kill one, push them into the river. And they watched how the second one struggled. He couldn't swim and drowned. And where there were no rivers, lakes of sea, they had to dig their own graves. And often they were buried alive. How come they didn't come for us? cannot explain how frightened I was. What is going to happen to us? Where do we hide? There's nowhere to hide. 
Where do we go? We can't go anywhere. My grandfather was a district judge. During that period of time, the bulk of the population were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. When my grandfather retired, we went back to practice law. He was also a lawyer. He took a bright young man, taught him to read and write. He became his assistant. These men became the mayor during the Nazis. To him was given the list of all the people to be killed. He took a blank ink and he crossed over 300 people. All my family was saved by him. My name changed from Egon Sonnenschein to Simon Meglitsch, my brother Franz Meglitsch. My father took a small suitcase, lifted the lining, made a false bottom, put a real document inside, put back the lining. I've always felt Jewish, although I didn't know what it means, until we came to Bosnia. Yugoslavia was my country. But when we were in Bosnianski Novi, the parents asked us if it means to convert to a Roman Catholic religion to save our lives, would you do it? Both my brother and myself, they said no. Even if we would have converted, if we wouldn't have been saved. We have been fortunate to hear the stories of survivors of the Shoah in their own words for our whole lives. We are approaching a time when they will no longer be with us to tell their stories. It is our responsibility to listen and bear witness, to remember and mourn in their name and in their honour, on their behalf and on the behalf of the six million who perished and would never return. Their stories have always served as a warning. In recent months, they have felt the need to make that warning even clearer. On 9th of November 1938, the Nazi regime murdered Jews and attacked Jewish life, wreaking terror and burning synagogues. Rather than condemn these atrocities, the world stood by and watched. Never have we, the survivors of the Holocaust, felt the need to make a collective statement until now. Never did we think that we would witness a reenactment of the senseless and virulent hatred of Jews that we faced in Europe. The actions of Hamas are so familiar, so barbaric, yet instead of condemning them, the response across the globe is a shameful spike in anti-Semitism. Our memories and our experiences in ghettos, concentration camps and in hiding. Seeing our families and communities vanish. Compel us to raise our voices and implore humanity to reject hatred, bigotry and violence. To recognize the agenda of Hamas, condemn it accordingly and call for the immediate release of all hostages. Men, women, babies and the elderly. We cannot allow history to repeat itself. It is one of the enduring facts of history that most anti-Semites do not consider themselves anti-Semites. We hate Jews, Hamas say, and we will obliterate your state. This covenant of the Islamic resistance movement, Hamas, clarifies its picture, reveals its identity outlines its stand, explains its aims, speaks about its hopes, and calls for its support, adoption, and joining of its ranks. For a long time, the enemies have been planning, skillfully and with precision, for the achievement of what they have attained. With their money, they took control of world media, news agencies, the press, publishing houses, broadcasting stations, and others. They were able to destroy the Islamic Caliphate, making financial gains by trading in armaments, and pave the way for the establishment of their state. The Zionist invasion is a vicious invasion. It does not refrain from resorting to all methods, using all evil and contemptible ways to achieve its end. It relies greatly on the infiltration and espionage operations on the secret organizations it gave rise to. They aim at undermining societies, destroying values, corrupting consciences, deteriorating character, and annihilating Islam. It is compulsory that the banner of jihad be raised, it is necessary to instill the spirit of jihad in the heart of the nation so that they would confront the enemies and join the ranks of the fighters. Israel will exist and will continue to exist until we obliterate it, 
just as we obliterated others before it. Jews had never completely abandoned their homeland. For the first time in 2,000 years, they were able to find refuge and control their own destiny in the modern state of Israel. Those already living on the land were joined by those who managed to escape persecution in Europe, as well as more from Africa and Arab lands. With the return of the Jewish state came a further mutation of the ancient virus. From its conception, its neighbors vowed to expel its inhabitants once again. Hatred of Jews has been a feature of life on the land ever since. The return home was a victory, but it required vigilance and safeguarding. Despite wars and ongoing conflict, none were prepared for the day which brought with it more Jewish deaths than any other since the Holocaust. Holocaust survivor Chaim Ranan grew up within the walls of the Budapest ghetto. He still remembers crowded rooms filled with waiting children, a field in which many would go, but only some would return. All Chaim knew for certain was fear. Liberated at the age of 10, having been robbed of his childhood, Chaim arrived in his ancestral homeland, seeking safety and peace. Chaim became a founding member of Kibbutz Berry. When I spoke to Chaim, he told me that the Kibbutz was a place where he believed he had learned from the lessons of the past. Believing in the fundamental equality of all people and the value of seeking the common good, he and his neighbors shared all that they had and they sought to live in peace. In recent years, they provided financial support to Gazans who crossed the border to work in their kibbutz and helped to transport sick Palestinians to an oncology center in southern Israel. On the 7th of October, 2023, Chaim's experience was terrifying. Like so many across the country, Chaim's morning began with the sound of rockets of sirens waving. Living on the Gaza border, he was accustomed to barrages of rockets often soaring overhead. With seconds to spare, he and his family made their way to the shelter in their home. He was yet to comprehend and couldn't have imagined the scale of the carnage. Chaim read as messages poured in, reporting that Hamas terrorists were infiltrating the kibbutz. The terrorists were attempting to break into shelters like the one Chaim was hiding in. Chaim and his family could smell smoke, thick and unrelenting, as the terrorists began to set their, his neighbor's homes on fire. I didn't think about the Holocaust at all. We were busy surviving. All around us, our friends are being slaughtered and shot. Houses are burning, and from all sides, you see cries for help on the group's WhatsApp. I know everyone. I don't understand how terrible it is. We are four people in a small size shelter. Me, my son, my nine-year-old grandson, Idor, and my nanny, experiencing terrible fear. Hiding in the shelter alongside Chaim was Idor, his nine-year-old grandson, a new generation traumatized by the ancient hatred. The hatred that had become a distant memory blurred by years spent alongside his loving family and kibbutz community, was once again tearing families apart. Across the kibbutz, the new generation, Ido's friends, were also encountering that hatred. As they raced from their beds to their safe rooms, they became the latest in a long line of generations to run for their lives. <laughs> הם פולנו, התחבנו מתחת למיטה, עם אמא שלי חסמה את הדלת. אמא ליפה חולצה שהייתה זה על היד, קשרה את הידית על היד שלה. כשהם הגיעו, הם פתחו ניסו קצת לפתוח את הממד. אני דחפתי את המיטה על הדלת. How did you know what to do? אני לא, אני פשוט שמתי כל דבר כבד על הדלת. And what, you pushed it hard? Do you know how many hours you were in the safe room for? 
התכתבתי עם סבתא, והיא התקשרה אליי ורשמתי שאני לא יכולה לענות. תשמע לי, מה קורה? יש מחבלים, רשמתי לה. סבתא שלנו התכתבה איתנו, היא התקשרה אלינו ואמרה, ירו בסבא. ואני זוכרת שההודעה האחרונה הייתה הצילו, הצילו. ואז איבדנו קצר. Was that the last message from her? While some were able to escape with their lives, none could evade the inevitable impact of that devastating day. Ido's friends live on, burdened with the memory of scenes that are impossible to forget. Tell me a little bit about how you are feeling today. I'm very happy, but I'm also very happy. וגם דודה שלי ובעלה שהוא גם כאילו דוד שלי הם שניהם חטופים בעזה וכאילו אני מתגעגע אליהם אז מה שלומך? How are you? לא בסדר למה? Why? סבתא וסבא שלי נהיה מתגעגעת אליהם? Do you miss them? אבל יש לי משהו שהם קנו לי עליי מה? What? Earrings? Oh wow, really beautiful. Who bought that for you? Grandma? Yes, and Sabah. Grandpa? Yes, and Sabah. I'm always going to be able to do all the things that happened in the village. וסבתא שלי כבר לא איתנו, אז זה עצוב. אני עוד מתאושש מהמצב, כי לפני כמה ימים הודיעו על שמצאו גופה של חבר מאוד טוב שלי מכפר עזה, שהיה ממש גיבור, ירו בו. אם הייתי ילד... שתי הלוויות בשנה שאני בקושי הולך ועכשיו יש לי משהו כמו 40. In the Jewish tradition, the lighting of a candle represents the kindling of the flame of the human spirit. On October 7th, 2023, approximately 1,200 men, women and children were murdered. As we gather together on the other side of the world, 132 hostages are still separated from their families. Aaron Lebranchik lights this candle in honor of his commander, Gil Avni, who was killed at the Nova Festival, the 1,200 who lost their lives on that day, and all those who remain captive. Please join us to pray for their safe return for the people of Israel and for those who keep them safe with Dobby Smith. Please rise. Avinu, Avinu, Sheba Shamayim, Sur Yisrael v'goalom. Avinu, Avinu, Sheba Shamayim, Israel v'galo Bareich, Bareich Et Medinat Yisrael Reishit smicha Keol natzeinu Hagein aleya Bevrat chastecha Ufros aleya sukat shlomecha Avinu, avinu Tzur Yisrael v'goalo Avinu, avinu Sheba shama Thank you.
Arise and go now into the city of slaughter, into its courtyard and wind thy way. There, with thine own hand touch and with the eyes of thine head, behold on tree, on stone, on fence, on mural clay, the splattered blood and dried brains of the dead. Proceed thence into the ruins, the split walls reach, where wider grows the hollow and greater grows the breach. Pass over the shattered hearth, attain the broken wall, whose burnt and barren brick, whose charred stones reveal the open mouth of such wounds that no mending shall ever mend, nor healing shall ever heal. At the heart of tonight's commemoration is the question, which period of Jewish history inspired this poem? Chaim Nachman Bialik asked us to walk through the city of the massacre. Which city? Which slaughter? Was it after the exile? Which exile? Which expulsion, dispossession, inquisition? Were these Jews Hungarian, Iraqi, Israeli? And what was the reason? Did they perish for their religion, for their race, for the nation state? When did these words describe our confusion, our grief, our despair? Perhaps the better question is when they did not. Puts a paper in 1904 Bialik's words were inspired by the Kishinev pogrom, which saw 49 Jews murdered. In the late Russian Empire, baseless rumours that Jews engaged in the ritual slaughter of children served as a pretext that justifies the killing of Kishinev's Jews. With every mutation of the ancient virus, there is a new pretext, a new justification. Our great tragedy is that the results of these lies are always the same. Jews are made to suffer. But our great triumph is that our response to that suffering in every generation, le dor va dor, is always the same. We escape, we make new lives, we mourn, we remember, we survive. Those who sought to destroy us are no longer here, but we are. We look to our survivors for guidance, for strength and resilience. Now more than ever, we look to them to light the way out of the darkness. We are fortunate to have one such survivor with us here. A gun song and shine. When we returned to communist Yugoslavia after the war, we found that half of my father's and all my, mo my mother's families were murdered by the Nazis, except for my three-year-old cousin Aviva. She was saved by a Muslim family, Prokic, at great danger to themselves. We adopted Aviva. I was delighted to have a sister. We have been very close ever since. 
we were not allowed to write school ex exams to catch up after more than three years during the Holocaust because we were Jewish. Only Slavs could write exams, discrimination. After one month, we managed to, uh, to annul it. The Yugoslav Nazis turned to become communist. It was a very oppressive regime. We would not leave Yugoslavia fast enough to immigrate to Israel, our country. To be able to leave former Yugoslavia to Israel, we had to renounce our Yugoslav citizenship and became stateless without rights. We were allowed one piece of jewelry per person, no money. The police were going to search us it would, if they would find even one cent. We would not be allowed to leave Yugoslavia. We left Yugoslavia in 1949. I was 18 years old. After five days on a small freighter with around 1,500 olim, we arrived in Israel. On arrival, we were covered with the DDT powder. This was our reception. We were promised a small townhouse within three months, but we lived for 17 months in a tent in Metolim Natanya due to the huge arrival of displaced Jews from all around the world. It was very difficult to find a job. In those days, there were only about 700,000 Jews in Israel. Plenty of food, but only 100 grams of red meat per month on coupons. After serving in the army, Israeli army, for initial period of two and a half years, I found a job in Tel Aviv. I worked 12 hours a day and traveled three hours a day, alternating the day and night shifts. In 1956, at the age of 26, I received an unexpected offer from South Africa as an assistant reading manager in the frame group comprising 17 factories and 32,000 employees. I wanted to learn English, the English language, in addition to the six the languages I already spoke. I took the opportunity. I ex expected to be in South Africa for one to two years. I left Israel with $10 because Israel was uh, short of foreign currency at the time. But I had a job. On the first night in East London, I met my wonderful wife, Miriam. My life changed for the better. I spoke no English. Miriam father spoke German. I was invited to four Fridays dinners. Being in a new country and environment, I had not, not even <coughs> didn't think yet of getting married. Whenever I entered the, ha the house, Miriam always played the blue tango on her piano, my favorite melody at the time. Eight months, six months later, I went with friends to Cape Town. Before I left, I sent Miriam a bunch of red gladiolos with a note thanking her and the parents for being so nice to me. Well, when I came back, the reception was special. We started to go steady, and soon afterwards, we got engaged and married in 1957. <coughs> a, year, a few years before meeting me, a teacher colleague of Miriam read her future from a teacup. Miriam was going to, be, to meet a man from the Holy Land. He will never have, he will have blue eyes, fair complexion and hair, and he will not be religious, and will marry him. Whenever Miriam went out with a student, she had a headache, except for me. This confirmed that I 
that she did, I was the right guy. <laughs> Miriam generally doesn't get uh, headaches. <laughs> we are now married 67 years. We are blessed with four lovely children. We brought my parents and my sister to South Africa. Miriam and I visited most countries in the world. I was appalled to find the abhorrent system of apartheid in South Africa. I treated everybody equally. We inherit the color of our eyes, our skin, and also the hair and the religion. But inside, we are all the same. I could not discriminate against people because I was discriminated during the war. I was, I was, pro, I was promoted to, uh, in, in the business to a VV manager, a general manager, and after nine years I offered directorship, but which I declined as I decided to start my own factory. I was determined to succeed in life. After the war, we boycotted all German goods for 23 years. But time is a wonderful healer. I bought German machinery, the only one available. It is important to take opportunities and be decisive. In 1967, I enrolled in a six-month course at the German machinery factory to be able to succeed I had to understand all details. I was the first in the world to invent new settings, systems, and designs. My products were much cheaper and nicer. <laughs> By me, there was no apartheid. I sent 16 people of color to Germany to be trained as a machine mechanics and introduced a pension scheme which was not yet available for people of color. I transferred, I transferred everyone, I treated everybody as I wanted to be treated. I spoke to all as I wanted to be spoken to. I always questioned myself, how can I do better? At all times, I'm an optimist. I elevated some employees of color to become managers and directors during the apartheid area. All salaries and wages were increased around and annually with a big bonuses. Very few people left. My factory became the biggest of this kind in the southern hemisphere with over 1,200 employees. I succeeded before all my dreams. We decided not to be service uh, servants of the apartheid and came in 1983 to the best country in the world, Australia. <laughs> we quickly made a lot of friends. We brought my sister Viva with her family to Australia to be together. We started a small factory which grew very fast. When laces and other produce were no longer in demand, we sold the machinery. We are now importing and exporting curtains and are very successful. My son Robert, who studied textiles, is very capable and is running the business. We have 12 grand, uh, beautiful grandchildren and are enjoying life in Australia. Our daughter Vivian passed away in Sydney eight years ago from cancer at the age of 56. After the hardship and difficult, difficulty of my youth, I experienced the hardest things life could throw at a person. We are missing her. It is important to help people in need and societies. It should be given from the heart. It is much easier to give than to receive. I'm telling my life story in schools on Fridays 
at the Sydney uh, Jewish Museum, going to business three times a week, um, working from home twice a week, and playing tennis four times a week. <laughs> While Mandela was inaugurated as president of South Africa, I was invited to his inauguration. I must have done something right in my life. <laughs> the most important achievement in my life was to marry the love of my life, Miriam, having a loving family, four children, 12 grandchildren, ex extended family, friends, and being part of a vibrant community. During the dark period of Holocaust, when I was down, I appreciated what I had and ad ad adapted to any situation. We never gave up. We did not dwell in the past. In instead, we looked to the future. Nothing did upset us more when people looked the other way, being bystanders. I have not lost faith in the humanity. The 7th of October was devastating. It brought back memories. I have faith in Israel and a strong army. From any adversity, we can learn and at time change it to the advantage. During the Holocaust, most countries refused entry to Jews in need. Today, Israel has the law of return which guarantees entry to all Jews. On this sacred day, we must honor also 28,000 recipients of the writers among the, uh, the nation, including the four members of the Muslim family brokerage who endangered their lives to save others. If not, for many wonderful people, some complete strangers who helped me and my family to survive. I would never, you, I would, would not be here to tell my story today. I'm looking with confidence into the future. Life is beautiful, it is up to us. in sharing your story. On Yom HaShoah, we light six candles to represent the six million Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust. We are privileged to have Egon's family here to join him in lighting the memorial candles. We ask Egon to light the first candle to commemorate those who were not bystanders, the righteous among nations, like the Proic family who risked their lives to save Egon's sister, Aviva. We ask Egon's wife, Miriam, to light the second candle in honor of our aunt and uncle, their twin children, and the 1.2 million children that were murdered during the Holocaust. We light the next candle for the survivors, those who are still with us and those we have lost. We honor them and their descendants who keep and share their stories into the future. We light the next candle for those who were murdered. Homosexuals, Roma and Sinti, people with disabilities, people of color, communists and Poles. We light the next candle for those who cannot be named. There are ones whose names we do not know and those who have been forgotten. The final candle we light for the Sephardic Jews who this year are commemorating 80 years since their deportation from Rhodes, Greece to Auschwitz, the final deportation of the war. May the souls of the six million live on in eternal peace. We ask Rabbi Yossi Friedman to lead us in reciting the memorial prayer.
is called prayer, meaning memory. History is found in books, but memory is found inside each and every one of us. And as I sing the following Kel Malera Hamim prayer, perhaps take a moment to close your eyes. It's a moment of memory. It's personal. Take one of the stories you heard about today, one of the messages, and make it your own. The next chapter of Jewish history, it's up to us to write it. to tragedy begins with the Jews being scapegoats for problems for which all are responsible. Today, the present feels like the past. Tonight, we commit ourselves anew to cutting off the mutating virus in each of its manifestations, to rejecting the false pretenses created in each generation to justify an ancient hatred. Thank you for choosing to stand with us today. Together, let us write a new chapter and recommit to survival and a future where never again is a reality. Pirkei Avot 114. If I am not for me, who will be for me? When I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, then when? Please remain standing for Hatikva to conclude today's commemoration. Mm -hmm. 